Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Not only ladies, we have some gentlemen also among, among us. So I'm the Secretary General of, of the Hungarian Women's Federation for World Peace. So I'm very thrilled and very happy to welcome you here today uh, on our today's event. And uh, we are really grateful and appreciate that you made this journey today, uh, especially those who came from Austria, Slovakia. And yesterday we had um, uh, Mitty and uh, Bridget came from England and France. So <clears throat> it was a really uh, something that you arrived and then we are starting already so quickly in this afternoon. So <clears throat> uh, maybe first I would like to just suggest who doesn't know yet that the translation will be in the back of the room. So here is the uh, Austrian corner and in the middle uh, Slovakian group and then we have Hungarian translation that a corner of the hall so those who need translation please sit around the ladies there and uh, yeah so I will be your moderator today and uh, <clears throat> maybe you know that this conference is a continuation of uh, international cooperation with our neighboring countries Austria and Slovakia so now to this year it was our turn to organize this event, this uh, conference. So we are so happy to welcome you here in Hungary, in Budapest. Uh, it is our pleasure that uh, so many of you wanted to come to participate on this program that uh, we had to even request the hotel to give us a bigger hall <laughs> because we couldn't fit into the smaller hall what we got first. So. Um, yeah, we have wonderful guests from all over Europe and, uh, and some of them will speak to you today uh, from Austria, Slovakia and Hungary, basically, and also uh, our presidents uh, from even more far countries. So first, I would like to, <clears throat> I would like to invite our Hungarian president, uh, just sit more. <laughs> Uh, she's uh, uh, Mrs. Katsuyo Benja, and uh, she looks like maybe as Oriental, but she's not. She's already living here for 30 years, so in her heart, she's already Hungarian, and uh, she will just give her uh, like uh, opening remarks to you. Yeah, so, Katsuyo san. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you, and. Uh, uh, welcome to our country and Hungary. And we are really, really, very grateful that we can see all of you. And we really would like to say the thank you for you came from far away and uh, traveling a lot. And you arrived this beautiful Budapest, our capital in Hungary. And we are so grateful to see all of you. And uh, so this conference is actually joint conference organized, sponsored by Women's Federation World Peace, Austria, Slovakia, and Hungary. Actually, already long time, we have a very beautiful relationship uh, with our neighbor countries, especially in Central Europe. And uh, so I can show some uh, slides, actually. So you can see here, uh, actually, two years ago, spring, we had a very beautiful events in the Bratislava in Slovakia. Uh, so actually we could celebrate 30th anniversary of the Women's Federation World Peace. And uh, yeah, we had a, such a beautiful cake and uh, really warm welcoming by the Slovakian Women's Federation World Peace teams. And so grateful and we never forget this memory. So this is our uh, events there, and afternoon we had a special events that we made the sisterhood ceremony among three countries. Actually, yeah, all the women we overcome that many historical background, many internal things, and we make the really beautiful sisterhood together among three countries. I have also Austria sister and Slovakian sisters. 
Yeah, I so grateful to participate. This we overcome borderline and we become little sisters to support each other. So like this, we had a beautiful uh, sisterhood ceremony. And this is actually uh, same year, 2022 autumn. We could go to the Austria, Vienna. And we had a beautiful conference. And uh, yeah, this really precious experience for us in Vienna, especially really Austrian members and the teams was really welcome us. Yeah, to, with a warm, warm, welcoming heart. Really, we never forget this experience. Uh, yeah, this is also from uh, Austria. So, like this. So, we really hope that the three countries' unity and really loving each other as a neighbor countries, and we can give this beautiful relationship to the, our generation, to our children for the future. Never fight each other that among these neighbor countries. We're really happy to see again from you that Austria and Slovakia, we are really beautiful, really community in the Central Europe. Yeah, today's uh, te topic, tema, the world uh, yearning of the woman's character, feminine character. So this now the day, this world is really not easy situation. And this conference title and topic to talk is very, very important. Yeah, we need this feminine character. We, we are women. We love the atmosphere, lovely atmosphere, and beautiful atmosphere, and beautiful relationship with each other. We don't want to fight. We don't want to conflict. We don't want to violence. But we want to really support each other and make really beautiful relationship with each other, and this we want to give to the, our generation safe and lovely atmosphere to give our children for the future. So this is really our wish as a woman and as a mother. Yeah. So we are so grateful to welcome all of you today, and uh, so we really wish that you can have a beautiful experience, our country in Budapest and Hungary. And three, please have a nice time in this afternoon, and please enjoy this conference. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katia-san. So now I would like to invite uh, our um, uh, European president. We are so privileged and uh, happy that uh, she could come to Hungary. This is her first time visit in Hungary since she's um, the European president. So I would like to give the word to Miti Toma. Yeah, please come. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So nice to see you. Yeah, like um, Tim, Tima said, it's my first time to come to this beautiful country. Uh, I've heard so much um, from, from my friends in the UK about Budapest. It is uh, very historical. And uh, the, actually, just after breakfast, uh, Bridget and myself, we went for a walk. And just down the road, about five minutes walk, is a beautiful, like, uh, what you call it, like a courtyard with beautiful buildings and magnificent actually so grand I was so amazed and uh, couldn't I just couldn't understand how such huge buildings could be built I think uh, people had huge visions for this nation so um, yeah thank you so much I'm very privileged to be here actually feel honored I got this inspiration when I was in Cyprus when we had our annual conference and uh, I heard about this uh, tri-nation meeting that was ha going to happen and I felt I have to be there just to have an experience uh, with, the, with the women who have been working especially around the, the whole project of the Bridge of Peace because Bridge of Peace is one of our signature projects where we want to really find true reconciliation between enemy nations or between 
different cultures, different races, and different religions. You know, a lot of our conflicts and problems in society are often around these issues. And if we don't solve them, then it just perpetuates. And the next generation is the one who has to pick up the baton and try and solve problems. So I feel it's very significant that these three, three nations are working together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, I want, I'm very much looking forward to all the speakers, you know, who are, are prepared their presentations and uh, very distinguished speakers who will share with us. I just want to share a little bit about what we did recently. I'm not sure how this works. Okay. Uh, also, the whole issue about um, you know women uh, are yearning, or the world is yearning for this uh, feminine leadership. I think also our founder, Dr. Moon, she really recently encouraged more and more that we should really support and educate mothers. I think sometimes mothers are undermined, or they just belong in the house, but actually they are the nurturers. They are the ones who really bring out the qualities of, in their children, and they are, the, they are the ones who raise the future leaders. So actually, I think we really have to support mothers more and more. And also, we try to deal with the whole issue of uh, past conflicts. It's a bit about the, uh, like the Bridge of Peace, but also the recent conflicts that are happening. And we feel the lack of women's uh, presence in negotiation tables or reconciliation programs. So uh, about three years ago, uh, in partnership with UPF, is our, our partner organization, uh, they set up a, an international association of first ladies to encourage the first ladies who are holding a, a high, highest office in the nation to come together to find some solutions, you know, from the grassroots but to the highest office as well. And this No Peace Without Women has been a, an incredible conference the last year we held it in Kosovo. As many of you know, there has been a, a lot of conflicts be between Serbia and Co Kosovo. And uh, we were invited by the government of Kosovo to come and give a presentation. And we had uh, over 120 participants, NGO leaders. Oh, okay, okay, sorry about it. You didn't, couldn't hear. All right. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Have to learn to use these things. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, this No Peace Without Women is a really important conference. And to get the government of Kosovo to support us is really important. And we've got the neighboring countries to come and also be there, like Bosnia and uh, Albania. And we also invited the, some representatives from Serbia, but unfortunately they couldn't come this time. Because uh, still at the border, the north border, there was conflicts going on. But uh, I think as women who are perhaps not in conflict have a, a, a responsibility to create the environment where there can be some kind of resolution or solution there. So it was really great. Also, we had the presence of the, the prime minister and the deputy prime minister who, who, who gave their words. But also we had the former president and his wife. And uh, the, the present president and his wife, they also attended this conference. So it's a very high-level conference. And we did do a resolution that we want to find a solution. And uh, one of the ladies that attended, she was the mayor of uh, Bosnia. And she really wants to hold the same kind of conference in Bosnia. Because as we all know, there has been uh, a lot of suffering with the Bosnian people. So this is our next goal this year, to go to Bosnia. So that's in discussion. And then um, I'll just move on to the next one. We've, uh, our, we had our annual conference, and this time we held it in Cyprus. I think many of you were here. Do you want to just put your hand up? Who, who attended that one? Yeah, quite a number. Yeah, this is also it was a very exciting conference to bring everyone together, because due to the COVID, many of us didn't have opportunity to see each other. And actually meeting each other like we are doing today face-to-face -face, makes such a difference. And we had really great distinguished speakers there. Um, we spoke on the whole, whole issue of education. Our society is very confused and we need to come together to find some solution. 
even around the ideas of gender ideology, you know, uh, uh, education for our children, and also about peace and reconciliation, how we can move forward together. And we brought a, a, a new generation of women as well, how, how the, the future generation are thinking about how to really take the baton and move forward. So it's a very, very important uh, conference. And we also had the First Lady of Cyprus attend, and she gave a wonderful presentation and talking about her own experiences of being overseas and seeing the different situations of women there and empowering them. And uh, we were lucky also to have our international president be with us, Mrs. Marika Hori. She'd just come back from Rwanda, where they'd had opened a peace uh, ed academy for children there who, are, who have lost their parents, who didn't have an opportunity to get education, which has been sponsored by WFWP. So that was quite an honor for her to come. But and also at the same time, she talked about this peace education that the Rwandan government has uh, set up. It's, it's a really important education program to rebuild the, 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 the nation after post-war post reconstruction. And education is the key. And the stakeholders are also the teachers, the, the students, the government. Everyone has a voice in this peace education. Uh, it's sponsored by uh, Sweden and America. But I think this is really important that the international community helps to reconstruct this nation that has been through terrible genocide. So it was a really, really important. Um, if you have opportunity, I would suggest that you look at this peace education, which could be replicated to other nations. Yeah, and then this year I'd like to announce we will have another annual conference. It will be our 21st annual conference. And I'd like to invite you all to come to this conference. And we're going to hold it in Poland. And the theme is that women making the change through, um, through peace building, through justice, and also through um, transformation, social transformation. I think we really need to come together more and more. And having such conferences like you're having today is really important. Because I think through conversations, through, through our discussions over a cup of tea or coffee, we can really try to find out deeper about each other. So I'm really honored to be here. And thank you so much to Katia San for really organizing and also Renate and, and um, Lubica, you know, and this is your third year. And I think you've made a great foundation for great things to happen. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miti, so much. So time is running. Anyway, we, we were starting a little bit late, so that's why um, we are a little bit late, but uh, now I would like to ask uh, Renate Amesbauer, where she is, yeah. Uh, she is uh, from Austria, she is the president of the Austrian Women's Federation for World Peace, and uh, maybe not so many of you knows that the um, Women's Federation is connected to the UN, so in Vienna, uh, UN work is going on, and then she would share about it shortly because we have main speakers, and uh, yeah. Anyway, we have to know everything today, so that's why really we want to, yeah, give the chance to uh, share about the UN work also shortly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hello. Good afternoon. We are very happy to be here. We really want to bring greetings from Austria. We are a group of 27 and we cover 15 nationalities in our group. Maybe they can wave. <laughs> so we are, it's like we always feel the whole world coming together when we meet in Austria, even in Vienna. I'm very happy to be here with you. And my task is to speak just very briefly about the voice, our voice as Women Federation at the UN, because we are sitting in Vienna and um, we really must say, we can show the next picture. This is the building, the UN building in Vienna. And we have friends in Vienna. So um, we are an NGO with an ECOSOC status. And actually, we didn't work for it ourselves. It was our Japanese uh, sisters and friends who, in the first years of the Women Federation, went out to 160 countries. And uh, they started programs there. Many times it was education, strengthening of women, supporting women and youth. And hundred, about around 100 of these projects are still continuing. And there's some sub Japanese sisters among us. So really, thank you so much. 
And through this intense investment, the Women Federation could gain the, this status, ECOSOC status, already in 1997. In Austria, it was Maria Riel who was working for this. She's also here. And um, because of this status, we, have, we, are, we are eligible to make uh, contributions to the UN. Uh, what you see here is our side events in Vienna. We have the special topic of crime prevention and also the prevention of misuse of narcotic drugs. And these are commissions when there is like 1,500 people at the UN, delegates of different countries. And we are, as NGOs, we can get a small place uh, for 50 minutes, and there we can make a conference in 50 minutes. Everybody, seven minutes, yeah? And so you see, and this interesting thing is we can give our opinion and we can give our topic. So we had last year stre strengthening the use. This was the narcotic drug last year. And we had YSP with us. We had the ambassador from Kenya with us, the lady in the middle. And our topic was strengthening use, encouraging young people and giving them the feeling that they are part of development of a country. Because if young people are positively engaged, then they will not start with drugs or whatever kind of things. Uh, it was very welcome. The next one was in summer. No, 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 they're not the same picture, sorry. Uh, this was healing the family relationships, means healing the society. Because actually many, we understand, we know, if there is a summer healthy family, then children stay home and they allow their guidance to give, their parents to give them guidance. So they grow up and when they're 20 maybe, they have some understanding of what's going on. And we are not all the only ones. We have um, uh, uh, no, partners, very good partners. And this is this uh, representing Dr. Malouf. There is also a unit at the UN that really says strengthening the family, it would bring so much to each society. And it's a prevention for crime, uh, criminal activities. Yeah. So now you can take the next one. And this is what we had this year. This was again at the narcotic drugs. Uh, conference. There was a, one lady is the ambassador from the Jordan. There is a, a very um, a Japanese sister having a beautiful product in Jordan. Then Maria Riel. Then we had a moder moderator, a young lady who is with us, so uh, Sulva from uh, Nepal, and we had representation from the Philippines. There's many Filipino sisters here. We are cooperating with the Philippine uh, embassy. And there's two men from a project that is healing for people who did get into drug or also internet um, dependency. And this is the topic in May. Family, again, strong family, essential support for the youth. And it's accepted. So we will have an event in May again at the UN. The next slide, because I have to be fast. And the UN in Vienna, it really is trying to help the NGOs to get a space. So there is four times a year, they call it constructive dialogue. They invite NGOs from all over the world if they can come, but it's hybrid, so if you cannot travel, you can come by, by Zoom to give their opinion, what can we do against human trafficking, smuggling of migrants, international cooperation. One week ago, it was trafficking of firearms, these terrible topics. But when we sit back, you can always say, please support families, support young people in your countries, that they have a proper education and if they see a future in their life, then many of these things will not go away, maybe immediately, but uh, become less. Yeah. And in these dialogues, we always meet very nice people, also very involved people. One was Sulva, we met her last year in Vienna, and this year we also made connection with a um, lady from Kenya, who is very involved to help the young people in her country. And the next slide. And uh, in Vienna, also the NGOs are working together in committees, committee on certain topics, and the one committee is Committee on Peace, and Maria Riel, Dr. Maria Riel, she's here. She was the chair of this Committee on Peace for two years, and this is examples, she had invited the speakers, very, very good topics, very good topics. And the next slide. And this is the other committees, like the uh, Sustainable Development, Status of Women, Committee on Aging, <laughs> I am a secretary there, Drugs on Drugs and Crime Prevention, and the Family. So these are certain topics where there's discussion, 
making recommendations and being present at the UN. And the next slide, I think it's the last. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I said I will be short. I have material with me. If you are interested to have something, you can come to me. I have some uh, reports with me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renate, so much. Yeah, so the Austria Austrian ladies are the connection to the UN. So if you are interested in the work of Women's Federation in the UN, then they can share about it. So we gave the title of the conference, The World is Yearning for Feminine Character, because we feel that the world is in imbalance until we don't find uh, our true values, our identity, our callings, and the ways we can heal this society around us. So women are those who give life, nurture, and protect lives. So we feel deeply the value of human life. That's why really peace cannot be made without us, cannot be accomplished without women. So today's speakers will share their deep insights how uh, and which way women can enrich this world. And our first speaker is from Hungary, Mrs. Gabriela uh, Papne Dancho. She's a speech therapist. Uh, she is the representative of Women's Federation in Seged City. It's, it is on the south part of Hungary. She meets a lot of women and educates them and teach them and shares their heart together. And uh, so let's uh, welcome Gabriela. So hello everyone, I am very pleased to meet you and I am glad that I had the opportunity to give a lecture today and I chose the topic to be a woman and uh, before starting I would like all of you, all the women of you uh, to finish this sentence just for yourself. So without uh, sharing anyone, just for yourself. What does to be a woman mean for you? Okay, maybe you are ready, but it's maybe not so easy to, to finish this sentence. <clears throat> but um, uh, before preparing this lecture, I asked uh, some of my colleagues and friends to finish this sentence. And uh, I collected uh, their answers, starting uh, from the positive ones and ending with the negative ones. And I will show to you. So to be a woman is a gift because I can give birth to children. It's a beautiful thing. It's good. There are both good and bad parts in it too. It's equal to, uh, to be subordinated by men. It sucks. Sorry to say, but this was the real answer. And uh, then I, I just bumped uh, into a picture on Facebook with a similar topic. Yes. So, so it is hard to be a woman because you must think like a man, act like a lady, look like a young girl, and work like a horse. <laughs> so, and um, so, uh, and I was thinking the, about the content of this slide and the previous one, and it really. Um, I question myself that what make women think and feel this way? And I think it's a huge topic and I'm sure that each of you can talk about it I don't know how many hours. That's why I just would like to share some of my thoughts uh, related with this topic. So I think that the main roots of uh, these kind of feelings and thoughts are in history because it's a fact that we live and we have been living and we were living in a patriarchal history which created a patriarchal type of culture which, were, which was based on getting and keeping the power, rivalry, fight and the words that are associated with it for me are dominant, aggressive, arrogant because it's a goal-oriented society and um, 
And this led to the involvement uh, of various stereotypes about women. And one of them, that women belong in the kitchen. So it means that it's their role to do the household chores and raise children. And uh, similar in meaning that women are the man's rib in the way that uh, women's task is to serve the man. And uh, it means that uh, men and women aren't equal, but uh, women are subordinated to men, so they are inferior to men. And I uh, would like to share a um, story from my own family. On my father's side, my grandfather was a carpenter. And, um, you know, he left for work in the morning, uh, then he came back uh, and had lunch, and then he went back to work. And my grandma always had to prepare the lunch by 12 o'clock. And what was strange for me, that um, this habit or this routine uh, didn't change after my grandpa uh, became retired. So even if he was at home and he didn't really have the housework, but still my grandmother had to prepare the lunch by 12 o'clock. And uh, then my father, who is, okay, he's the, the son of my grandfather, so he saw this as a child, and for him it was the same uh, pattern, that um, in my family, my mother did almost all the housework. And uh, finally, she was fed up with it, and she quarreled uh, with my father. And after this, my father started to realize how much burden is on his wife. And I think, anyway, that um, a lot of men don't do this um, on purpose. So they not in intentionally are sexist, because this is a kind of built-in sexism. But they saw this as children, it was natural for them, because it was the part of this patriarchal culture that they were brought. And um, uh, they never sit down to think about it by themselves, because if they had done it, then they would have realized that actually hoovering the carpet or doing the washing up, uh, so they are skills that both men and women can, can do, can have this ability. And, uh, in this society, not only uh, a lot of men are, uh, have this kind of built-in sexism, but even some women are sexist about themselves as well. Uh, for example, I just uh, bring an example. Let's say there is a little girl, and uh, their parents always tell her when she cries that Oh, your pretty face is, is not so beautiful when you are crying. Please, don't cry. Be happy. And if it always repeated to this little girl, then finally she will get the message um, that she, hide, uh, she has to hide her emotions and that uh, she must show happiness and beauty because society is only interested in what she looks like and what she shows but she isn't really interested in her personality, for example. And uh, this kind of stereotype uh, uh, led, or another kind of stereotype about women, the blondie, uh, which means that uh, this kind of woman is uh, really uh, sexy, and, uh, but at the same time uh, they are dumb, which means they like their eye like a, a, an accessory uh, that um, even doesn't have an own personality, and she is someone with whom a man can be publicly seen. And uh, just to sum up all the things that I said, that put, uh, society put wrong expectations on women that was hard to bear and, uh, and willingly fulfill. Because, of course, they, wanted, they didn't want to fulfill it willingly. <clears throat> and that's why we can understand why women wanted to get liberated from this patriarchal dominion. And uh, we can ask if uh, the attempts were successful and have they ever been liberated in a true sense? 
and uh, it's a huge topic, and that's why I just would like to, to highlight uh, some periods from history and some phenomena from history. For example, the feminist movement, uh, which had, had different stages and types, but the main point is that uh, it aimed to build a society where women can have the same rights and same opportunities and the same power as men. And uh, the same right, for the same right, they fight it for the right for voting, and uh, they only got it uh, in the most part of the world only during the 1920s and 30s, so quite late. And those of you who come from Slovakia and Hungary, we just can think of our mother's generation and uh, to imagine what kind of burden was, was put on their shoulders because um, I wrote uh, it in, a, in an article from the 1950s. What was the social, in, in the socialism, the woman ideal? And the woman had to be active, she had to work to be present in society the same, um, the same amount of time as men. And uh, she had to lead a household in a creative way. It was interesting for me because it was written to, to lead a household in a creative way. They had to raise children and they had always be put together, which means they should always take care of her appearance. This uh, picture for me shows the, the essence of all of these. And some pictures from socialism, how they treated equal women to men. And in America, the hippie movement, um, for example, uh, the main goal of the hippie movement was, wasn't to liberate uh, women, but um, it was a kind of result uh, too, but it uh, championed sexual liberation, and um, unfortunately, um, women became sexual objects much more than before through this movement. And the phenomenon of glass ceiling in our society, which means that women earn less money for the same job. I uh, read in a newspaper that in the European Union, women earn 16% less uh, than a man. And this kind of phenomenon had a side effect that women leaders with masculine traits appeared. And uh, I also would like to share um, an example for it from my own life, that uh, there was a period when I worked in a primary school, and we got a new boss who was a lady. And um, carnival time was approaching, and this new boss of ours uh, appointed one person to organize the event. And... Um, this colleague of uh, mine had to find others to help her and all the responsibility was on her shoulders. And after uh, this um, program uh, was over, she was really fed up with everything. And I think that this, is, for me, it was um, a woman leader with really masculine traits because she was interested only in the result, that the event had to be done and that's all. And uh, the, um, another uh, workplace where I worked, uh, I had a woman boss, uh, and when we had to organize something, we always um, sat down together and we had brainstorming. And um, she appointed, uh, first of all, she always asked volunteers. And if no one applied, then she appointed more people, not only one, and she shared the responsibility among them. And I remember also that many times she prepared food uh, for these meetings. And for me, uh, her way of being a leader uh, was a real um, feminine type woman leader, and uh, her work for me was associated with collaboration, empathy, and uh, relationship building. And because of this history and this kind of uh, culture in which we were socialized, 
we can, all of us, have a certain heritage. And we come from more or less troubled past, each of us, and uh, because of this, we develop certain uh, thought and behavior patterns. And I think that for most of the people, uh, this kind of unresolved heritage appears when they get married and they raise children. And um, maybe you know the song from Jennifer Rush, The Power of Love. And uh, there is one line in its lyrics which really hit me very much when I was thinking about this topic, that we are heading for something somewhere I've never been. Because I'm really, I really think that by uh, living in a marriage and by raising children, we bump into hidden doors within us that we didn't want to fa face before. And or we didn't even know about their existence, many of them. And that's why uh, this uh, living in a marriage and, uh, and raising children can be an obstacle for us because it's really difficult to face these things. And after that, we finally decide, I don't want to bother with this, but it can uh, bring us opportunity to change. And I don't say that uh, this change is easy because not, e not easy, but at least at the beginning, okay, it's difficult, but with the passing of time, um, my life become better and better because of my personality changes. And you may have heard about uh, Gabor Mate. He is a medical doctor and a psychologist uh, of Hungarian origin, and he wrote some books which became bestseller. And I think that it's not a coincidence that uh, they, these books become bestseller because he deals somehow this topic. And uh, one of uh, his books is The Myth of Normal. And uh, he, wrote, uh, he writes about how traumatized people live their lives. And there is a quotation from this book. The abnormal has become the norm. The unnatural has become the inescapable. So he says that uh, the abnormal expectation of this society in which we are living make us sick. And the patriarchal society distorts and misuses the typical feminine traits of personality according to this um, society interest. And how has it taken place? Uh, as an inborn ability, women are closer to their feelings. And this society somehow distorts this ability into a wrong direction. Because uh, usually, even since their childhood, girls are conditioned to be over-obedient. And they usually become the balancing force in a family emotional matrix. And uh, they grow to take responsibility for other, others' feelings too, which, with the passing of time, grows into a huge burden on them. And he said, as a doctor, that it's not a coincidence that 78% of autoimmune patients are women. And he shared about uh, his marriage as well, and I saw a documentary uh, with him and with his wife. And um, they talked about uh, their marriage, and uh, he said that uh, she, I mean his wife, um, so his real self when he wasn't able to see himself yet properly and she was able to love him in, in this state as well. And uh, somehow she was like um, a mother uh, to him and helped him to be, to be born in a spiritual meaning. And so they both uh, have been healing each other. But he also emphasized that both men and women need to realize that marriage can work if uh, both do for it and if both have at least the determination to change. And he also said, which was really interesting for me and made me think, that um, um, we treat our nature, our environment, in a way, as this patriarchal society treats women. And if you think, I've never heard like Father Earth. I always heard Mother Earth because it nurtures us. 
and it makes life possible. And uh, it's, I, I, think pers I myself think personally that it's true if we change our way of thinking and acting, then we, uh, we have a different attitude toward our environment too. And to sum up, uh, I think what is more in, the most important is uh, to digest our past uh, to be able to live in the present. And um, we should really engage in personality development because through this we can build the ability of self-reflection. And I think that both men and women have common goal. Uh, to understand and accept themselves and each other. Uh, pers on pers a personal, family and society level as well. And uh, we also should question the stereotypes existing in the world and which we inherited from this patriarchal history. For example, some of the stereotypes. Is it only the woman's job to do the housekeeping and raising children? And does a man do a favor if he helps a woman in housekeeping or is it also his responsibility? And I think that there is a rising awareness in society. For example, I regularly lead a a high-quality uh, woman magazine in Hungary, and um, they always uh, inter uh, regularly interview uh, male celebrities, and uh, many of them are open in this direction. And um, when I was preparing for this lecture, uh, my daughter, who is 19 years old, uh, she said um, that so she belongs to the Z gen, Z, Z generation, and, you know, they use a lot of media platforms. And she said that uh, this kind of built-in sexism, this topic, is regularly discussed on these platforms. So it means that they try to, to change in this uh, direction. And what we to, uh, which was a taboo for even in my teens and for, for my uh, mother and for my grandmother, it's not really today, so it's, I think it's a good direction. Yes. <laughs> and the key is um, to, to be sincere with ourselves and within ourselves and to have an open conversation with and within myself and with others. For example, this built-in sexism, because we can talk about it. So if there is a problem, I think that the, sol the solution starts with talking about it. And after that, we can make the steps to, uh, to improve it. And uh, I think that we as uh, women have an excep uh, exceptional ability, uh, which is uh, to give birth to children. And uh, because of this... Uh, close relationship with our little one from the beginning. That's why we, I think, and through raising children, we have somehow the ability to, to heal ourselves and to heal and to help healing others too. And I don't uh, want to blame men because I think that this kind of patriarchal society put a burden on them too. The expectations of this society put a burden on them too because they're deep inside them, I think, many things not really help them. And um, that's why I think that we don't need matriarchy, we don't need patriarchy, but I think that men and women should become allies to each other. So they should complete each other, as the sign shows, but not compete with each other. And uh, in this um, world full of turmoil, we really need those women who start this process, this healing process. And it's not only about women, but about men as well, I think. So thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much. It was really deep and uh, really make us think about our own heritage. And um, yeah, in our families, we can see also uh, different yeah, experiences, how, how many things we just uh, got as a heritage from our parents and what we see. So now, uh, one of our precious men, guest speaker will come. Uh, Mr. Joseph Gundake from Austria, and just shortly I introduce uh, him, that uh, he immersed himself into the character education, marriage and family enrichment. He organized the, the annual uh, True Family Award from uh, 2006 to 2011, and he is the author of a book, Principles of True Love and Sexuality. And he's a father of five children, and his wife Lily is with us here. So they are a very beautiful couple, example of a harmonious uh, husband-wife here. <laughs> so we are very privileged to listen to him now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Come. Welcome. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. So first of all, also. I thank you, uh, Gabriela, because as, uh, you, are, you made the connection that as, uh, it's also today as about men. And uh, this helps me because for me it's really an honor to be here, to talk here. At the same time, I say it's also a challenge uh, because to talk in front of so many women. Oh, wait a minute, where are the men? Oh, there are some. <laughs> okay, thank you. But I think as a... Uh, in a sense, um, I hope I can be equal to women uh, today. And, uh, and I learned as in my life, as a, in my 40 years of, of married life, as also uh, many, many things as a, uh, from my own wife. She is as a very strong, and I appreciate that. What I would like to talk about today is... Uh, 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 the principle of true love and sexuality. Actually, as I would like to mention that um, I'm just uh, in the process to to uh, to develop as a, an educational concept for character education and personality uh, a personality development based on the on a principle of true love. And so it's my honor to to talk today. Uh, on that uh, on that issue first a uh, few thoughts before that uh, think uh, for a moment about it there's a power that when used wisely brings prosperity growth peace and happiness but if it is misused, this power turns against us, throws us off course and brings tears, destruction, misfortune and war. This power, power cannot be broken, but you can be only broken by that power. What do you think it is? It's the power of love. Also, Many people don't believe it. Love is a clearly verifiable value that we consciously make, can make the basis of our actions. I think we are all inspired by love. We are moved by love and uplifted by words and stories of love. The words I love you are the most powerful in any language. But even if we are inspired by the ideal of love and stories of great love move us deeply, each of us experience time, times when a shadow falls between our ideals, desires, dreams, and our actions, which paralyzes us and destroys our, our relationships. We are often confronted with people who are selfish and unloving. Despite these obstacles, we continue to hold a deep longing for the great love and ideals within us. 
And most of us would do anything to free ourselves and the world around us from this pain and suffering if we only knew how. I hope that works. Can I? Okay. Thank you. The biggest misunderstandings I learned in the last 20, 30 years are today about the nature of love. Love is understood by many people as an emotional high that takes away the feeling of emptiness. The Swiss writer Max Frisch posed the following question in his diary 1996 to 1971, where he wrote, Do you love someone? And what makes you think so? What makes you think so? For Max Frisch and probably for many people, the answer to this question is, I don't know. There is chaos in my heart. And so, how can we build, how can I build a stable, peaceful and harmonious relationship if there's chaos in my heart? That's, okay. Love, and this I think we have to remember. Love is not primarily a feeling of affection. Rather, love is a disciplined process of mind, emotion and will in which we create trust, consistency and stability in a relationship. Like a great work of art, a successful human life is built over time through consistent, purposeful and virtuous action. Therefore, I think all of us, we need to learn and to develop strategies of love, or in other words, we need an educational program also for the development of our character and skills to build secure and trusting relationships. Second, with a misunderstanding of love, there is also today a huge misunderstanding of sexuality. In social media, on television and in newspapers, we read and hear daily reports of corruption, affairs and sexual abuse. These are stories of disappointed love relationships and bad sex, bad in the truest sense of the word. Morally bad, because we cheat and hurt each other. And qualitatively bad, because it is simply unsatisfying and always leaves the partners hungry for better. It's like someone who only eats junk food. They are constantly constantly hungry for and always want more. The German author, journalist and psychotherapist Eva Maria Zuhorst writes in her book Love Yourself and It Doesn't Matter Whom You Marry. That's the name of the book and it's very interesting. She says, hardly anyone realizes how much emotional damage this sex fast food causes. Young people are given technical sex education, but their longing and search for true intimacy and closeness remains unfulfilled. Many people flounder around, testing frequencies, practices and partners, but hardly anyone experiences the real depths and nourishing connection of physical love or 
even knows its powerful spiritual dimension. It's worthwhile to mention, to read that book. <laughs> Now, I want to draw your attention to a topic that has been implemented throughout Europe in the field of education, it, and it, it is the topic of sexuality education and the so-called standards for sexuality education in Europe. This was published by the World Health Organization Regional Office and it is a framework for policymakers, educational and health authorities and specialists. Sexuality education aims to help children and young people develop basic skills so that they can take control of their sexuality and their relationships at different stages of development. That they can live their sexuality and partnership in a fulfilling and responsible way. That sounds good, doesn't it? With a wonderful name, Intimate Citizenship, the social sciences propagate today a negotiating morality. What does it mean? This negotiating morality, they say, this, this uh, is the standard of today's sex education. Intimate citizenship sounds like trust, respect, and appreciation. But in reality, it is deceptive, deceptive and often manipulative. And I would mention briefly why, to look at, have a closer look at that. This purely secular morality of negotiation and consensus means that the content is negotiated by mutual agreement between mature, equal, and equally powerful participants. Whether a consensus was reached honestly or through falsehood is irrelevant. However, Many consensual relationships are characterized by insincerity, lies, and deception. The people involved often deliberately act in a very immature, in a very immature, deceptive, and irresponsible way. Virtues such as sincerity and honesty are mentioned in the standards for sexual education only as a footnote. Strictly speaking, the morality of negotiation is a morality of, of deception. According to social sciences, sexuality is a product and natural force that basically serves only to satisfy sexual desire. And children and young people should therefore acquire sexual competences. Please think about that word, sexual competences, and that as early as possible to be, to be able to act in a, what they call sexually intelligent way. They, they say children should be encouraged to learn and practice what gives them pleasure, what excites them and what they expect from a partner. To acquire sexual skills also means the ability to, see, to deceive others in a sexually intelligent way and to, to, to seduce others with sexual stimuli. There's a lot of talk in professional circles about developmentally sensitive sex education. And I myself, as I, in Austria, I'm in a working group 
uh, about uh, about uh, the whole issue of sex education, and this developmentally sensitive sex education again sounds very very good. However, it is very questionable, questionable whether this scientifically correct knowledge contributes to a responsible sexual lifestyle of people, or rather serves to just irris to to justify irresponsible behavior. Because words of love can be very ambivalent and deceptive often. If the sexual knowledge serves to seduce other per another person, then it becomes the source of conflict and strife. The sexual knowledge serves them to find competent excuses and justification. The problem with today's sex education lies in its materialistic understanding of human beings as merely bio-psychosocial beings. You might have heard that term, bio-psychosocial beings. This has reduced our sexuality to a product and a cheap commodity. How does a person feel who is treated only as a product and sexual object. This person is not valued in her humanity, feels exploited and always has the feeling of not being free to make one's own decisions. The materialistic and consumer-oriented way of thinking, this is a way of thinking, suppresses the human heart, its longing for relationship and commitment for appreciation and true love. Under these conditions, people can never develop their original nature, talents and abilities. Instead, it leads to deep, to deep humiliation and alienation. In the book, The Art of Loving, from Erich Fromm, you may have heard about that book, he says, true love, which is more a giving than a taking can hardly be reconciled with capitalist society. Now I come to a more positive outlook again and I would like to talk about now uh, the principles of true love and sexuality. I think we all know sex that sexuality presents a huge challenge for many, many people to pursue it in a fulfilling way. There is no other word that triggers such strong and conflicting emotions in people. Today, more than ever, we are faced with the ambiguity between bad and good sex, between the subversive sex of red light districts and one night stands, and the beautiful sexual intimacy of a loving couple. Unfortunately, the dividing line is not so clear and unambiguous for most people. The permissive norms of today's age, where everything seems to be permitted, make a sexual sexuality based on true love and mutual fidelity almost impossible. And therefore, this is precisely uh, the reason why the question about the true meaning of human sexuality, the true meaning of marriage, and the responsibilities associated with sexual love need to be asked urgently. So, what is the meaning of sexuality? In the book, from uh, the well-known Austrian gynecologist, Dr. Huber, he wrote the book, The Holistic Human Being, and he writes about sexuality. Sexuality is the instrument designed by nature for reproduction. Everything has been devised for it. 
Everything has developed towards it. Sexuality is perfect in its process for reproduction, great in concealing all efforts within the organism so that it can be an ecstasy rather than a burden, burden for man. The purpose of sexuality and every existence is to continue to exist, to preserve the species. Since we are spiritual beings at our core and have conscious and a heart, sexuality also has a deep spiritual dimension. Sex is more than the satisfaction of a sexual, a sexual drive. It unites man and woman physically, emotionally and from the heart and thus it creates the basis for a new, in your life. For this reason, true love education involves providing insights into, into sexuality and guidance on how to channel this marvelous force. The search for the other half is part of us, part of the genetic code, so to, so to speak. In, the, in a Confucian text, in the doctrine of the middle way, it says, the moral man finds the moral law in the relationship between man and woman. Now I would like to uh, reflect with you about the effects of a good Blessed marriage, I would say, effects of good and pure sex. First of all, sexuality strengthens the bond and the feeling of exclusivity. At the center of human sexuality is the expression of love that arises from a continuous committed relationship. In this sense, being a couple means practicing one's own capacity capacity for love in the otherness of the other person to experience love more deeply and profoundly. And that means taking full responsibility and meeting the other person genuinely and authentically. True love, true sexual love creates genuine intimacy, uh, intimacy uniqueness and and exclusivity. And secondly, sexuality is a place of deep inner healing. Marriage is not a magic formula for happiness and well-being. The true purpose of marriage is always to balance the inner conflicts of both partners. It is the place where our unfulfilled needs can be met, our ability to love can grow, our inner blockages can be resolved, and wounds can heal. Where above all, we can look at our deep inner split between our desires and our reality. Also, the inherent possibilities of intimate encounters in marriage are more abundant and deeper than in any other form of relationship. Nowhere uh, do our deficits emerge more clearly than in a committed, lasting partnership. It is in the marital relationship that everyone faces the most difficult tests and where we can learn and grow the most. This makes marriage a place of deep inner healing and discovery of true giving love. Actually, uh, the book, as I mentioned before, also from, from uh, Eva Maria Zuhost, she says, um, uh, she says, Marriage is like the the uh, the university, the the university of love, yeah, the university of life. Yeah. As a summary, 
I recommend and uh, suggest that three things need to be taught in educational programs in, uh, in our schools, in our school systems. And these, the character education needs to be an integral part of the standards of sexuality education in Europe. We have simply to suggest that, and because um, the need for character education is a need that we learn to grow toward maturity, to love, to learn to love the truth, to learn to love being truthful, good, and beautiful. And so I put together three points. The first point is love, to understand that love and sexuality are the essence of human life and human dignity. Secondly, sexuality and love are two sides of the same coin. They cannot be separated. And third, third point is every person is responsible for their own body and their sexuality. With this, I would I'd like to conclude that topic. And uh, for those who are further interested or who want to share, I wrote a, uh, the book a few years ago about the principle of true love and sexuality. I have it, it's still as in German, I have it with me. And secondly, I have also uh, with me, uh, which I put together, uh, 30, 30 questions and answers on the topic of, of the whole, uh, of the whole uh, sex education in Europe. Yeah. And uh, if I have, a half, do I have another half a minute, so I would like to give you some reflections. This I wrote uh, in the last few weeks. Reflections on love and sexuality. Although love cannot be measured. Everyone knows that it exists. Some say love is eternal. Others say love is fleeting. Some say sexuality is sacred. Others say sexuality is a consumer good. Love is the origin and source of life. We can find love by connecting with that source. Sexuality is love, life, and, and heritage. If you abuse it, you destroy love, life, and the future. Therefore, choose love and life. Choose the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. It was really uh, beautiful and also as uh, women and uh, as uh, mothers, really we have uh, things to do with it because we are responsible for our own families, uh, responsible for our own uh, surroundings, like communities, and um, yeah, first of all for ourselves. So we have to really understand the real uh, meaning of this growing up in a, in a true way and, and uh, nurturing our children in a true morality. And uh, yeah, this education is important for all of us. So those who are interested in uh, Joseph's book so can ask about it, how to get it, and which language uh, is needed. So we are uh, running out of the time, but uh, still, anyway, <laughs> we will manage the dinner. We will ask the... Um, restaurant to yeah, serve later. <laughs> so still we have one more a lecturer from Slovakia. Uh, shortly I would like to introduce her. Uh, she is uh, um, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Renata Ocilkova. And then uh, after obtaining uh, her medical education, she graduated from the Faculty of Pedagogy and uh, the Faculty of Social and Economic Sciences of the Comenius University, as well as the Faculty of Education of the Catholic University. She was visiting a student at the Humboldt University in Berlin. And uh, now, uh, presently, she is the president of the Slovak Society for the Family. And she's the author 
of the book, The Truth to the Youth. So this session is about education, so I would like to give the mic to Renate. Yeah, welcome her. Okay, thank you for invitation. I appreciate that you are sitting now here in the time for coffee break. I appreciate it very well. I try to skip something. Okay, thank you very much. I will read my uh, lecture uh, because of my English. I apologize, but okay, thank you for your willingness to concentrate uh, yourself now. Last year, I published a book for teachers and parents about how to talk to young people about sexuality, relationships, the anthropology of men, about human identity, homosexuality, transsexualism, etc. Since the book was published, I have met over 3,000 teachers and parents and almost 2,000 young people. I have received many questions to which we have together searched for answers. Today, I want to share some experience of mine with you so that we can inspire and enrich each other. What I tell the children about? I tell about the biological differences between male and female when life begins, facts about sex, male and female characteristics, behavior, research, hormone levels, body structures, cycle about gender identity, uh, sexual attraction about doubts during adolescence about the importance of friendship. The challenges ahead us are easier and more difficult. Easier are to learn a certain amount on information and transfer it to the children. More difficult challenges are to win the hearts of the young, convincing them that we mean it well with them and to keep their attention. Okay. <laughs> Questions or attitudes that children and young people express very often are, is there any research that can prove that life begins at the conception? Prove that sex is genetically defined at the moment of conception. On what sample of respondents was this research conducted? It was primary school children. Disagreement with the definition of typically feminine and masculine characteristics, rejection of so-called stereotypes. Claiming to be, def to be feminists. In one lecture, a 14-year-old boy said he disagreed with me because he was a feminist. Believing that the sex can be changed today, that they, are, they have fresher information than I do. And, but if I feel it that way, but if he, she feels that way, feelings are elevated to the highest level, they are considered the only benchmark. Children spend much more time on social networks than we do, and they are manipulated by various influencers. I ask students, when does life begin? When is sex genetically defined? From whom does sex depend? Where is our genome kept? By asking and answering these questions, the children should realize that life is created at conception. The genetic sex is defined at the moment of conception when the entire genetic equipment of human being is created. Then I ask in what ways are differences between men and women to realize the differences between the male and female sexes are marked in several areas. In morphology, in sex hormones, in thinking, in behavior, in the perception of external stimulations and in internal experience. Concerning sex hormones, men and women have both hormones, testosterone and estrogen but at different levels. A man has 10 to 50 times much, uh, te as much testosterone as women. Sex hormones have also an important function in protecting of our health. 
Estrogen is responsible for protection of organs and functions associated with motherhood, prevention of cardiovascular disease, prevention of osteoporosis. Testosterone influences brain architecture already during prenatal development and becomes apparent shortly after birth. And it also protects the man, man's health, preventing blood thickening. And what properties is estrogen responsible for? For example, for cooperation, carefulness, submissiveness, emotionality, maternal intuition. Testosterone is responsible for competitiveness, adventure, dominance, rational cal calculation, assertiveness, open to risk, etc. On this topic, children tend to protest. But attention, we are talking about hormones, not about people. That is the mystery why we are different, men and women. But even within the same sex, why we are different, original, there are different nuances between us. But what does it mean if hormone levels are different? That we are different. If a woman has elevated testosterone levels, it doesn't mean she has to be androgynous or that she is lesbian, much less that she should have sex change. It means that she may be ambitious, with tendency to be assertive, achievement-oriented, have leadership tendencies, be less communicative as a rule, and choose not to pursue charitable professions, but rather technical and system-oriented professions. In view, may have a more masculine body type. If a man has a lower testosterone level, it doesn't mean he's gay, and certainly not that he should have sex change. But he may be predisposed to the arts, to the humanities or social sciences. He may be more empathetic and social. He may be a good doctor, good artist, psychologist, priest, or a very good husband, like mine. <laughs> when do behavioral differences between men and women start to appear? What do you think, when? When? Birth. 100% clutch for who? Lily Gundaka. Really? <laughs> Perfect. From birth. She said from birth. Okay. Professor Simon Baron Cohen from Cambridge University, the expert on autism, has carried out research on newborn babies. 102 human neonates who have not yet been influenced by social and cultural factors were tested to see if there was a difference in looking time at face, social object, and at mechanical, mechanical object. Results showed that the male infants showed a stronger interest in the physical, mechanical object, while the female infants showed a stronger interest in the face. The results of this research clearly demonstrate that sex differences are in part biological in origin. And if we go even further, then already in the 14th week of pregnancy, girls move their jaw more often. <laughs> and what about the gender identity crisis? I ask children, where is the genetic information about your sex stored today? Where? Yeah, exactly. In cell, in every cell, in every nucleus of the cell. And if every cell of your skin, hair, nails, teeth, bones, etc., carries the information that you are a woman, if you would have your breast surgically removed, would you become a man? Never. Never. Is it possible to change gender, to change sex? Here sometimes some young people answer that yes. And I so ask them, how can it be changed? And they themselves nicely come to what can actually be done. They say something can be surgically imitated to make one resemble, look like the other gender, and those are the right words. To imitate, to resemble, look like. 
surgically we can remove or remodel something. Hormonally we, hormonally we can stop or start something. But genetically there is no chance to change sex. It is a mutilation of a healthy body. The sex cannot be changed. Experts from the Czech Society for Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy on the treatment of gender dysphoria say that psychological development as well as brain development ends around the age of 26. Therefore, a child and young person is not supposed to make any conclusion about his or her sexual orientation or desire of a change in gender identity until adulthood, that means until the age of 26. The young person cannot be left alone in this, but needs to be guided, a person with both wisdom and correct scientific knowledge, with regular and long-term professional psychotherapeutic help. The Society for Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy on the treatment of gender dysphoria says, we must warn what the so-called sex change will cause. Irreversibility of physical damage, the risk of undesirable side effects of hormonal and surgical interventions, possible significant deterioration of the psychological state, increased risk of suicidality and disability. What does irreversibility of physical damage mean? Breast amputation, removal of the mammary glands, amputation in penis and testicles, sterilization, genita sexually non-functional. What side effects can cause opposite hormones? Hypertension, heart failure, cancer, mainly genital, thromboembolic disease, headaches, irritability, infertility, reduced bone density, osteoporosis, brain male development, insulin resistance, posing additional risks such as rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, sleep apnoe syndrome, edema, worsening of liver parameters, up to toxic liver damage. Increased risk of suicidality and disability. There are statistics on the high number of suicidal tendencies in people who have had a sex change or who have made coming out before adulthood. It is recommended to postpone coming out and thinking about the so-called sex, sex change until as late as possible, because the earlier the coming out, the higher the suicidal tendency. Can the surgery help? Sweden researchers Brandstrom and Pachankis between years 2005 and 2015 have analyzed the medical records of almost 3,000 Swedes to whom had been diagnosed the gender dysphoria. Researchers compared people who have undergone transition, chemical or surgical, with them to have, who have not undergone this. The result was that taking hormones alone during the transition process does not affect overall mental health. And even surgical transition does not have positive impact on the mental health of the subjects. Here is a graph showing the differences in mental health between those who with gender identity disorder who have undergone surgery and those who have not. Despite of this and many other findings, affirmative therapy is still being promoted today. What is it, affirmative therapy? This is affirming a person's feelings, even they are deeply contradicted with biological reality, appears to be an easier path, but without evidence of measurable results. Recently, a Finnish psychiatrist, Dr. Rita Kertukaltiala, who founded a gender clinic in Finland and has herself given more than 500 assessments to people with gender dysphoria, made her opinion public. Dr. Kaltiala said, gender affirming care is dangerous. I know it because I helped pioneer it. Dr. Kaltiala says she gradually found that people had more psychological problems after surgery than before it. 
that affirmative therapy and surgical changes did not help treat psychological problems. So let's cut to the point. If a person is dealing with gender reassignment, there are serious issues behind it. There may be trauma behind it, long ago or only recently. Stress, lack of love, bullying, an invisible child at home or at school, wanted masculinity, wanted femininity, unconfirmed masculinity or unconfirmed femininity, sexual abuse, etc. And mostly, it is a combination of several factors. We need to draw to the deep, find the reason and heal the reason. I mentioned one example more. Daniel Black. Daniel Black is a young man from Czech Republic. I know him personally. Daniel had a number of psychological problems, including a gender identity crisis. When he was 16, he asked for a sex change. When he was 18, he underwent a genital amputation. One year, year later, he regretted it very much. Today, he tells his story publicly to warn young people not to be deceived. He says, I am a boy and I had my genitals changed into girls. I made a big mistake. What I say has nothing to do with faith, quotation from Daniel Black. I am an atheist. These are just the facts, Daniel Black. And what about sexual attraction in the adolescence? Who do girls normally like? We know, yeah? And who do boys normally like? We know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's in our nature that girls like boys and boys like girls. But it may be that this is not the case in adolescence. The first sexual desire may not be directed towards the opposite sex because the adolescent is seeking his, hide his, his ideal of beauty, his ideal of, of masculinity, femininity, seeking his identity. Girls may earlier, boys later, go through so-called homoerotic phase, which is an intermediate temporary phase related to adolescence and in almost every person it will disappear by the period of adulthood. It is important to wait for sexual interest to become crystallized. What is the scientific answer? Dutch psychologist, psychoanalytist, psycho psychotherapist, Dr. Gerard Ardweg, who has been working on the issue of homosexuality for 45 years, states in his professional writing that there is no scientific evidence that homosexuality is caused by hormones, genes, or specificities of the brain. Scientific research does not support the hypothesis that homosexual orientation is immutable or inborn. On the contrary, there are testimonies of people who sometimes in the past felt attraction to the same sex and after proper guidance, guidance by a professional lived a proper heterosexual life. I know such people. The most extensive genetic research on homosexuality has been conducted in 2019 in a sample of more than 477,000 respondents. And its findings were published in the top scientific journal Sciences. The results of this research are commented by its author Andrea Gana as follows. There is no gay gain. The sexual behavior is influenced by genetics at most up to 25%, and the majority is influenced by the environmental and cultural factors. That means that other influences play a large role in cultural, social, family, or individual experience. 
Also, the homosexual gene has not been proven. We must say that these people live among us. These are our friends and we are to treat them with respect and love. Respecting the dignity of every human being. What is our task by working with children? To in investigate, search for the cause, to help them, heal wounds, accompany them, not to judge. How to help them? To love, to be merciful, to accompany them, to have time to talk with child, to try to find out cause, explain, 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 calm and reassure the child. Don't push so-called gender stereotypes, to affirm their true gender, to collaborate with professionals. Everything in details is in my book. <laughs> and if we can, to pray for them. In conclusion, I will add one of my experience. I was contacted by mother of 16-year-old son. Let's call him Robert. Robert hated his male gender and wanted to get transitioned into woman. I talked with, he, with, with his mom for a long time together, searching for the cause. I started with the simplest of questions, for example, like whether the mom didn't want daughter when she found out she was pregnant or if the father and son are doing father-son events. This is because it's very important for affirming masculine identity that teenage boys have events with adult men at least once a while. Camping, for example, camping, hiking in mountains, uh, trip cycles and so on. Mom replied they, they don't do it because they didn't know it's important, but they do family trips. So I assessed there was nothing fundamentally wrong in this family setting. And so we investigated further. further. Then I asked mother to go back deep in her memory to think if there was some period in Robert's childhood when he began to express himself or behave differently than he had before. Mommy answered very quickly. I know it exactly. I don't need to, uh, to think about it. When, she, when he was four, year old, four years old, she said. And so we searched for what happened then. This time was born Robert's sister and his grandfather died. The little sister naturally was given increased attention in the family. And his grandfather, with whom Robert had a wonderful relationship, died. His grandfather had been with them all the time before. They were always playing together and had perfect relationship. And he suddenly got sick, got cancer and died. He died young. Robert cannot forget him. He remembers him every day. Robert must have made this assessment in his childish little head that men die young. And when he started to become a man, he was afraid of it. And so he denied his manhood to the point that he wanted to erase the manhood from his life completely. Today, he probably doesn't know even why. He just says he doesn't want to, to be a man. So I offered this, man, this mom to contact one psychologist who could accompany them. I called the psychologist professor right after our conversation and told her what was going on. In response, response the psychology professor said a memorable and powerful sentence for me. When a, boys, when a boy forgives, great things will be able to happen in his life. Forgiveness. Often young people stand before us insecure, confused, overwhelmed, broken, 
who have done nothing wrong, wrong. They were not guilty. On the contrary, they have experienced trauma that has hurt them. These are situations that we cannot undo or, re or reverse. And so the first step, the only way is forgiveness. Forgiveness heals, recovers, restores. Forgiveness often brings new life and answers to difficult questions. Okay. Thank you for your attention and for your time. Thank you, Renate. It was really touching and in a way very rare lecture, so we are really grateful that we could hear it, this approach and then this many researches. So those who are interested in the depths of this uh, book and then lectures, please turn to Renate. Thank you so much.